Right, let's do this. Hey folks, how's it going? 1300, we better crack on. G yeah, good to see you all. Um, Michael, it's been ages. How's... Shit, yeah, how is everything? Um, hopefully, yeah, the last time we, we spoke, you had that big contract that you're getting with a, a certain banking type client uh, <laughs> but yeah anyway um yeah i guess this is one way only <laughs> um but yeah please I, I i do encourage you all to to use the chat box um i i'm gonna move everything over so i can see and yeah i am seeing how things go um <clears throat> on my other screen so for those that are um, joining us today, this is actually part two. So last week, if you go to this page, so last week I showed a video um, or I did a live session, which was called Biz Self-Coaching Questions and why the idea is relevant, etc. And basically we spent all that time going through all of the questions that you need to ask yourself if your biz is in, not distress, but is stress. Um, so it's definitely worth watching that. In fact, I'm going to put the link to that in the actual chat thingy right now. Stop screen sharing. So last week, chat. So it's worth bookmarking that because, yeah, your business is struggling a little bit. You need to go through those questions. And today, um, I guess we're going to continue because... Um, I had a bunch of questions that you need to ask yourself if your business is growing, uh, like Michael's, et cetera. So um, I think we should just get into it. And then, yeah, please write your, your questions in and I, and I will get back to you. So let's share the screen. And I'm hoping this works. Yes. Cool. So yeah, as you can see, um, you can very easily self-coach yourself going through these stress questions, et cetera. Um, and today we are going to go through the fun stuff. Well, I, I say it's fun. It's just um, the happy stuff, if I should be a bit more accurate. So where is the text? Instead of writing the questions, I'm just going to type them. Let's see how this goes. Right. So the first one is this. What is the thing? Oh my God, I can't type. The thing that your clients like and dislike the most. So this is a, um, why can this not go any longer? Here we go, yeah. So this is an important question because you may think you know what um, your clients like and dislike, but every time I do a survey, um, you. I'm always very surprised and I like to survey my clients, you know, once a year, once every 18 months. Uh, I'm, yeah, some could argue that you should do it more, but I'm of the, the band camp that I don't like pestering people, uh, which is why I never do any, you know, crazy email campaigns and or any, you know, heavy pushing or anything. So yeah, what, what is the thing that uh, your clients like and dislike? Now, I don't know which book it was, but I read it many years ago, and they're saying that um, if you, let's say, uh, you, you you chat with the client, and they say, right, I really love A, but this thing that you do, B, I don't really like. Um, and they're saying that the easiest way to make that person happier is to provide more A and do, so you can still do the thing that, dis, that they dislike, as in B, um, but if you were to improve A or give more of A or, or whatever, happiness levels increase a lot, um, a lot faster within your, your clients. So, which I found quite interesting. And I, and years ago I did a little experiment and, um, and I don't know, let's just say everyone said they liked this thing about this part of the business. They didn't really like that. So what I did is I split test that whole audience. So the thing is that the, the, the dislike one, what I did is I put a lot of effort into stop doing this 
or you know to to reduce the amount of whatever this thing that they they disliked and i just kept doing what i normally did with with a and i then resurveyed them about 3 months later and went you know what what about now and, the, and guess what the results that they gave back were yeah i uh, yeah i like a as i mentioned and uh i know you're doing a bit less but yeah and and so i then flipped it with the other cohort from from the original survey i basically just ignored b i just kept doing you know what they did not like or whatever or it was an aspect of the business which they just didn't like and i tried to do i tried to put the jacks up under to a and you know do, do more of it or whatever it may be so and then guess what happiness levels in, increase and i thought that was pretty interesting so that's the first question can you actually provide like can you focus more on the things that your clients like rather than what they dislike um i mean if you take a tesla for example i've had a bunch of teslas um and there are many things i like about tesla uh, as in tesla cars whether it's model s model um, x etc um but yeah there's a big list of things i dislike about them and a big and an even bigger list of things that i do like about them so when i had my old model s it was like a rocket ship and the party trick is that it went not to 60 in 2.3 seconds it was great and it would make people feel sick if i had a lunch and i did a few you know <laughs> launches it even made me feel a bit queasy but that was one of the things i liked i liked the big screen the sat nav the the smooth riding and the ridiculous acceleration whereas and that was the thing that that really really made me love the car the things that i disliked about the car were so yeah that they were sort of um, dwarfed by the things I liked. Um, so it's an iffy analogy. Like all the things I liked made me overlook the shitty build quality. <laughs> you know, when you have a 125 grand car, you expect the interior to be better than the average 30 grand car, which, yeah, the interiors have always, yeah, they've not, not been the best. Anyway, so moving on to the next question. If I do this, control c control v can i retype this yes i can lovely jubbly cool next question is how can you provide more of the likes which we've already like chatted about three is what is your monthly distributable cash flow right now So yeah, completely side set, Ooh. distributable, distributable cash flow. So this is interesting. So um, for fear of teaching you to suck eggs, uh, I'm going to do it anyway, because a lot of people still don't know the, the, the you know, the, the core basics of biz cash flow, et cetera. Um, and, you know, repetition is the mother of learning. So screw it. So, for example, you have revenue, you have direct costs, or otherwise known as COGS, costs of goods sold. And so you have plus revenue, you have minus direct costs, and that's left with your gross profit. So that's one line or one sort of section of your PL. And then you have your, you minus your OPEX. And then after your OPEX, you have. What's left is your EBITDA. Now, personally, now you can speak to loads of different accountants and they'll all say slightly different things because some people will put your CapEx inside here, but I don't. Uh, your capital expenditure are like one-off purchases. So it's not like a true representation um, of your, you know, your monthly in and outs, if that makes sense. So what's up, what's left here is your um earnings before interest tax depreciation amortization and so when you get rid of your you know your uh your it does your interest tax depreciation amortization you're, you're basically left with your net profit okay i'm being very rough here so let's say net profit but i wouldn't class well some people would say that your your net profit is your distributable cash flow um but personally, what I like to do is subtract a few things from this. So the 
obviously when you're taking a dividend, that dividend comes from your distrib distributable cash flow. But I like to take a little bit from your um, net profit and put it into R and D. Um, the now you could say mentoring as, as well, but you know if you're if you're going to be paying for mentoring and stuff like that, it really is part of your OPEX up here. But yeah, I like I like to um, I like putting the R and D at the bottom here now. So, but I, either way, you're you're left with your distributable cash flow. Now again, I can argue with or loads of people go, oh actually, just put your R and D up here as part of your OPEX, etc. But yeah, I don't want to go into it. But so this then means you then have guilt free distributable cash flow um and that is really what i'll you know th that's the answer to the question like what is your distrib distributable cash flow and what what is it obviously every business is different it could be two grand a month and you could be happy as larry or it could be two, 20 grand a month and you could be really pissed off so, so the size of your business and what you do really depends um everything is relative i guess so whatever your, um, but before you improve anything, you need to know certain metrics. So that's question number three. What is your distributable cash flow? Because then you can, uh, four is what would the business need to do to 5x that within 18 months? So you're probably thinking, oh, why, why 5x? Why not Grant Cardone 10 exit? Um, so the thing with 10xing and the whole 10x world is that it's more of a marketing gimmick, really. Because in order to sort of really 10x something, you're going to have to do completely dramatic, like dramatic changes, like pretty big things. And normally when you 10x a business, it takes a long, a long time. It, it really takes a long time to 10x something. But Believe it or not, 5Xing your business can be done within a few years if you do things correctly. Um, it's, yeah, uh, well, I mean, hell, whether your, your, your figure is 3X, 2Xing, 3Xing, 5, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, the, the, the purpose of these questions is, you know, how can, we, how can we grow more? And the reason I personally choose 5X is that the things that you're going to need to do to your business will be um, a lot different than how can we increase profits by 20% next year. You know, you can just tweak uh, existing your, your your existing business model and, you know, squeeze out an extra 20, 50%, um, you know, next year. Like if you've got 100 clients and everything, all, all things being equal, in, you know, to increase your business by, say, 25%, you just need 25 more clients. With everything else being equal um and so you can you know ramp up the the marketing a bit you can make sure that your conversion rate optimization is good all you know little bits and bobs but to 5x your business no you've got to change your business and this is the reason for these questions and so obviously i can't give you obviously everyone here is different you're all in different places so i can't just give you an example of that but um you, you need to spend a fair few brain cycles on what would the business need to do, comma, to 5x that within 18 months. So the time limit is also important. You don't want to be 5xing your business over, say, a 10-year period. That's a bit slow. Um, so how can you do it faster? And the reason for that relatively short time frame is uh, just to stop complacency. Um, you know, so you, you get things moving. So the next question, I'm, I'm going through these questions a lot faster than I did last week. Um, I get rid of that. Is is current setup even able to 5x within 18 months? And that's really the crux. So um, for these two questions, like, can you even 5x your business within that time frame, or hell, within even say 36 months? It's um, well, let's just say within one to three years. Can you even do that? Because let's give you an extreme version. Let's say I am selling cupcakes, okay? So I'm selling cupcakes from my oven at home. Um, the maximum revenue, 
like the 100% maximum capacity revenue like uh, for this business is completely like um, kneecapped because I have one oven, right? So if you have a typical oven at home, it's got, you know, however many trays, you can't, you can't even use all of the shelves because your cupcakes will burn if it's too high. So really, like, let's say your oven and let's say you're busting a gut, making as many cupcakes in a, in a 24 hour period as possible. Your cup, you know, you're, you're only going to be producing cup, you know, X amount of cupcakes. And then like, what are you going to sell those cupcakes for? Is it, you know, if you, if you sell them at 10 P you're going to sell all of them pretty quickly. If you sell them at 10 pounds a cupcake, you may not even sell any. So what is that spot where you can sell all your cupcakes every day, 24 seven, you know, moving forwards. Um, so what this means is that you're, you're left with like X amount of revenue per month and like, and that's operating at hundred percent capacity and also hundred percent sales like you sell all of your stock every month. But how would you, like, can you even 5X that business within one to three years? The only way you would do that really is get more ovens. But then, you know, can you even sell? Like if you had, let's say two more ovens, could you sell that extra capacity in the marketplace you're in right now? And like, obviously this is an extreme example, the, the answer is no to pretty much all of these things. So let's say I, I'm, I live in Norwich. I have my, you know, I can sell a bunch of cupcakes to the local area. If I, all of a sudden I massively increase the, the amount of cupcakes I can sell, like, uh, you know, I'm probably going to saturate my local market, even with just one oven. So, yeah. So really, this business is not a business that can 5x within one to three years you have to change the, the the type of business you're doing so in order to do that i'm gonna have to instead of going b to c and selling door to door or you know like girl scouts do or whatever i'm going to have to you know um can i go b to b you know can i get one big frick off um oven make you know a, a far larger amount of cupcakes and then sell uh at, top of the tap like can i sell big chunks of cupcakes to shops or can i be a white label factory for an existing brand or it's etc so that by doing that you are completely changing the way of that business um you're still selling cupcakes yeah but you're now b2b you're not b2c you don't have to dick around with a million different customers um you could technically sell to one or two suppliers oh uh, sorry um clients you know uh, you know, brands or, or, or whatever. But that is what I'm trying to poke you in the brain for right now is, you know, is the current setup even able to 5X within one to three years? And normally the answer is no um, for most businesses. If the answer is yes, then you have different questions. Like if the answer is yes, oh, wait a minute, this leads us to different questions. Um, um, so if the answer is no, then you're, you're basically asking yourself, like, okay, what then? As in, you know, what business model would I need to do to do that? If the answer is yes, then great. You're up happy street because then it's a case of, okay, increase, ah, sorry, increase um, rev by doing, you know, or obviously, obviously increase rev. Uh, in, let's say increase marketing, um all that sort of stuff um get more sales people uh, more industries like in your niche can you go deeper in your niche or can you go wider in your niche um you can do one or two things so <clears throat> the so the next question is this When I control C to even copy the little squiggle under under the five. Interesting. What ad spend would you need to draw? Ad spend would be needed to um, achieve this. Now, this is sort of a leading question because I um, I've sort of jumped forward a little bit. It's sort of a, assuming that the answer is yes your um your existing model can do this 
Um, so then it's a case of, right, what ad spend would be needed to achieve this? Or what ad spend and slash or sales infrastructure, infrastructure would be needed to achieve this? Um, and so you, yeah, uh, but like, by the way, if you aren't going through these questions already and your business is prospering, you probably most likely already know your cost per clicks, your click through rates, your cost per acquisition. But this, like, let's say your, I don't know what your products may be, but let's say your, your CPA, your cost per acquisition, as in how much it costs you to buy one customer through direct ads is that. Um, and you need another, you know, a thousand clients to dramatically increase your business. Well, then it's a case of that times that. It's um, what is that? Hundred k? Sorry, my maths. Hundred times a thousand times is a yeah, hundred k. So all of a sudden, you now need that. Okay, I need to go out and raise a hundred grand so I can just plonk it all into ad spend to get roughly a thousand clients. Now, obviously, when you scale your marketing, your CPA will go up. Okay, so instead of um, yeah, most of the time your your CPA will, will go up because you're because you're advertising with a far bigger daily budget. You're going to saturate saturate the well, yeah <laughs> um, your your target market a lot quicker. So you're going to have to change the type of ad, the ad copy, the angle, all that sort of stuff a lot faster. Potentially, potentially, obviously. Um, there's so many uh, variables here that I can't possibly uh, say things that, you know, equate to every business. Now, obviously, it's not just that, like, I mean, it's handy if um, you have, you know, uh, a business which just needs marketing and not a sales team or anything. But if you have a sales team um, or a business that needs sales infrastructure, then it's slightly different because you've got your marketing sort of at the top that generates leads. And then you need to close the leads. And so that's where the sales people or the sales team, they close them, right? So you don't, when you get a salesperson in your business, they don't do lead gen, okay? You do not waste their time doing lead gen. If you want someone that does lead gen and closes it, that you're, you're talking about a different beast altogether. That's what a, a BDM, a, a business development manager. That's someone who goes hunting, kills the kill, kills the animal, skins it, cooks it, presents it on a plate for you. Um, so typically a BDM will have a relatively high salary. Um, and they'll also have commission. Um, but if you have a system, yeah, like a traditional sort of marketing and sales team, it's the marketing uh, that generates the leads and those leads go through to the sales people and here you have these sales people have low salary if not zero salary uh, and very and high commission it's all about commission so yeah ha have a little think what ad spend or and or sales infrastructure would be needed to achieve this i just want to go backwards quickly because i've sort of led the question here i want to go back to is the current setup even able to 5x within one to three years what if the answer is no well, what then? So I guess you have to go back to the, the basics. Is the industry that you're in good or bad? Is it a booming industry or is it a bad industry? Like right now with the advent of all these AI tools, industries you don't want to be in is copywriting, SEO type stuff, anything which, you know, chat GPT-4 can do or any large language model um, that may be coming out in the near future from, you know, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, all that sort of stuff. Um, you need to be in, a, in an industry that yeah, that actually has legs. Don't, you know, if, you, if you're in an industry which is dying or is about to be disrupted, yeah, you may need to th rethink your whole business. Um, so is the niche, let's say your niche is, your, your industry is all right, but is the niche okay? Are you in the right niche? Are you in too early, too late? Is it saturate, saturated? Um, saturated or saturized? Oh, my brain's not working today. It's one of those. <laughs> um, is, the, is the niche right? And then do you have the correct product, product market fit? 
product market fit. I mean, that's pretty crucial. You could be in the right industry, the right niche with the right product, but do you have the correct market for your product and vice versa? Because you have different markets within you know, the same niche. Like for example, you could front, for example, be in the real estate business. So that's the industry. The niche will be um, detached housing, let's say. So a detached house, but there's different markets for detached houses. You know, are, are you looking at, you know, 10 million pound houses? Technically, that's a detached house. Or are you looking at 300K detached houses? Like the, the market's completely different. So it's pointless, you know, if you've got a, um, if you're selling a 20 million pound house, it's pointless putting it on. I don't know, right move, let's say, you, you're probably most likely wanting to, you know, market it to, in other places. So yeah, product market fit, um, you know, is the product any good? Um, is the market suitable, etc. cetera? Um, and like, are you executing everything perfectly? Or not perfectly, but are you executing it good enough? Um, so these are, yeah, oh, and also you just need to do like, what are the incoming threats? So for example, you may have a business that's doing all right and is, is absolutely fine over here, but over the next couple of years, there could be some crazy threats to your business. So uh, do you want to sell up now? So one of the questions, you know, one of the things that you could end up leading yourself to is going, oh shit, actually, I see this threat. It's not an issue right now, but in two, three years time, it's going to be a right nightmare. I may as well sell up now whilst, you know, the market is hot and then get some cash runway to sit and sit on my ass and think about things. Um, so can, you know, can you sell up? Cause then if, if the answer is, Oh shit, I need to sell. You, you're, you're now leading yourself into a whole bunch of new questions you need to ask yourself. Um, but that's for another, uh, another time. So, um, yeah, like, okay, prime example. I'll, I'll give you a real example. Um, oh, wait, where's my hat? I need to get my hat. Here's my hat. So, I, um, how do I look? Yeah, there we go. I've got my tinfoil hat here. So talking about potential threats, I am legitimately scared of uh, a certain thing that may happen in, in the business world. And I don't know when it will happen, but I'm pretty sure it will happen. So I've said this before, and this is probably where I'm going to lose half of you because uh, you'll think I'm an idiot. But the, the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab are are increasingly talking about a cyber pandemic okay now before we go any further before you think i'm a complete idiot uh let's have a look let's open up youtube shall we and just type in cyber oopsie cyber pandemic into youtube and oh look at this okay so if you Go on to the World Economic Forum's actual YouTube um, and then, I don't know, cyber. Have a little look. There are loads and loads of videos of the World Economic Forum and Klaus Schwab constantly talking about averting a cyber pandemic. Klaus Schwab, the head of um, Beth, he's calling it cyber COVID already. And they, they keep, and they've been talking about it for a while, but it's, it's increasing. Um, and he's saying that there was a very scary video, actually. Um, well, I want to show it because it's very quick. It's Cyber Pandemic World Economic Forum. Um, there's like an anime. Uh, where is it? Simulation. Uh, no, I can't find it. Two years ago. No. Is it? There is a, um, the WEF, that was one year ago. Is it this one? No.
No, it's not the one. It was literally a video of Klaus Schwab saying that how the you know the lockdowns that we had in COVID uh, will be absolutely nothing if there is you know compared to a cyber pandemic, and he was saying that you know everything temporarily would shut down, so you'd see a big shutdown in infrastructure, food production, food, um, the, the whole food supply chain, like energy, uh, electronics, the internet, and that how the internet would have to shut down or pause temporarily and a new internet would emerge and uh, no doubt any device that doesn't have their recommended <laughs> antivirus software is not not allowed on the internet or something you know basically looking at what china has with their internet and going huh we want that so i'm looking at this going well shit what if he, what you know what if that is true what if that does happen how can I insulate myself now? How can I start insulating myself now? So if shit really does hit the fan, I'm actually happy as Larry or I'll, or I'll even profit from it. Um, and if it never happens, nothing hurts. You still got a business. So one of the things I'm trying to think of is, can I set up a business which is not reliant on the internet? Can I set up a business that not only is not reliant on the internet, would thrive in a, a new cyber lockdown or even another you know viral lockdown of some sort um and during that environment let's say there is a lockdown of some sort because the po population across the world has now been conditioned to accepting lockdowns and you know not moaning too much could this business be encouraged to stay open by the government and also does it tick all of the you know the bullshit ESG boxes, environmental, social governance stuff that the that BlackRock um, is pushing out. Oh, by the way, ESG that term, environmental sustainability and governance, that is um, that term ESG was created by BlackRock, and the WEF love it. They're running with it, etc. So now, yeah, we're moving into a world where any business that doesn't tick all those ESG boxes is going to get penalised, carbon tax, all that sort of stuff. So can I have a business that you know meets all those criteria? Not internet you know, would thrive, let's say, if the internet were to have a pandemic, lockdowns, government would, you know, want you to stay open, all that sort of stuff. And I keep coming to, and, and I look back in 2020, 2021, of, okay, what businesses were encouraged by the government to stay open? Um, and the conclusion I keep coming to is this. Food. Literally. Like every time I, I run through this this conspiracy thought experiment, I just keep coming to the con conclusion: shit, I need a food company. I need even better a massive wholesale food type company where, if there was a lockdown, the government would encourage me to keep the lights on, to keep the the business, blah 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 blah. And so, like, yeah. I'm now thinking is again this whole thing is nothing to do with my existing businesses but you know can I take some of my distrib distributable cash flow or let's say even the R&D uh, pot um this you know the monthly you know R&D spin off cash can I use that to now spin off another company which creates a, some sort of food company you know food with high longe high longevity non-perishable foods like rice pastas or whatever like but massive wholesale you know and then just for easy cash do i have a, a farm shop connected with it or you know can i i don't know i the answer is i don't know i'm just spitballing some stuff here right hat away um It's more of an insurance policy than anything. Um, so, yeah. Right, where were we? <laughs> uh, question number seven. Here's the next question. Control C. That's easy. Control V. Um, is this 5X business able to run? completely without you so whatever business model or thing that you you have and let's say you can 5x it is it able to run completely without you can you go for a three-month holiday come back and the business has grown without you 
you know, has it grown despite of your absence? And if the answer is no, well, then you need to write out a big list of all the things that you actually do in the, in the business and then outsource them and remove yourself. Um, and if, you, if you're sat there thinking, oh, no, my business definitely won't work without me, blah, 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 um, you are falling into a, um, a, the typical business owner sort of mentality of, like, you know, uh, it, it, my business ro revolves around me. It would definitely not run without me, blah, blah, blah. It, it's bollocks. Um, it is completely rubbish. Every business is able to run and thrive without their founder. If it's set up correctly. And so this is a big thing. So, and guess what? If you can nail number seven, let's say you can 5x your business and it runs without you, completely without you, you now have a business that will be bought. Not could be bought, will be bought if you if you put it out there on the market. Um, and so that that is the goal. You really ultimately need to run, create, set up, run and grow a business to you know whatever your your you know profit targets are and even if let's say you've got a business that makes 100 grand a year and it run and it does that without you great sell that business easily for 500 grand easily 5x even multiple so i guess yeah i don't have 10 questions like like last time i've got seven questions this time um yeah i guess really the crux of it all if I was to boil it all down, is like um, correct um, industry niche product market fit product market fit um, <clears throat> 5x a bull autonomous autonno autonomous that's what you basically need to get and when i say autonomous not like with robots but just can you get rid of yourself can you get out of the way of your own business uh, and that is really what you need to aim for because then if you can sell baby sell um and the beauty of this is that i think a lot of people go from zero business experience or you know the, and thinking that they have to set up the next tesla or set up the next you know uber airbnb and that is the, the, a massive massive fallacy if i was you know if you if you're starting out and you let's say you're a typical middle class person right you've got a nice job earning between 30 and 60 grand a year um, you're valued, you're probably ops manager, blah, blah, blah. Um, you're a clever chap or chapess, um, like, and you want to get into business. You don't need something that just, you, you know, knock something out of the park for six, like set up something, um, like aim for, aim to get a business that to begin with, that can chuck out 50 grand a year profit a net profit sorry net profit and it's systematized systematized okay if you can do that you could easily sell your business for a quarter of a million quid and worst case let's say it's, it's not that systematized you're going to be selling it for 150 you know 3x um so yeah, in essence, you, you, you're really looking at a, a business exit of that. Now, and, and that should be your first thing because then you've done through the whole process of set up, run, grow, sell. That's the full business cycle. Now, when you look at this, you're, let's say you do sell for, at the worst case, 150K, right? You will not get a big lump sum of 150K. Most of the time, let's say, let's look at the worst possible outcome uh, for you. You're going to get 50 grand in cash. And you'll have 100K deferred. Deferred. And um, let's say worst case, let's say there's no APR involved with this. Let's say it's deferred. 
over three years. Okay, this will be a great deal for the buyer, shit deal for you. So what is that 100K deferred over three years? So that's um, 36 months, so 100,000. Divide that by 36. You then got basically 50K cash plus two, seven, 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 seven <laughs> recurring per month. Okay. So if you can get this business set up, 50K profit, systematized or not systematized, you sell the business for 150K, which is actually, by the way, really easy. Um, it's easy to set up, easy to sell. You can then, you'll then be landed with 50K cash, which let's say is, you know, a year's worth of a normal salary, plus a pretty good income over the next three years. So what does that give you? That gives you thinking time plus mental space. Okay. All of a sudden you've now effectively got a chunk or not effectively, you've got a chunk of cash that you can deploy into something into another business. Okay. Don't just spunk it on a car like I've done many a time. Um, you got, yeah. Thinking time. You can sit on your hands and observe with no stress, no like, oh shit, what I need something, you know, I need money to pay the bills, whatever, because you'll have a chunk of cash, you'll have an income coming in, which will be, let's say, comparable to an ops manager's salary or, or, or whatever you're already doing. Um, and then you can take your time and then your next business, you can plow that 50K in. So the next time you, you, you do the cycle, you know, you do the thing, instead of selling for one point, so 150K, you're going to aim to Set, set up something that sells for 1.5. Like, it's very rare that you get someone that goes from zero to, you know, a billion in, in their first business. Anyone that you see in the news that has sold a business for a billion dollars or whatever, I, I promise you they've had a, a you know, they've had multiple exits along the way. Multiple exits. They know the game. And it just so happens the thing that you saw in the news was their most recent exit. Like if I sold a business, you know, over the next couple of years for 10 million pounds or whatever, I, it's not because I've done that, you know, from scratch or whatever. It's just that the news headlines don't see, you know, the previous 10, 20 years of sweat, time, toil and tears. <laughs> um, so. so let's go through the questions now. Um, Da, 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 da. How I go? Yep, blah, blah, blah. Esoterium has says, <clears throat> in the future, we will likely have have to exit the system and build our own world outside it. Yeah, I, I, I agree. Um, the, I mean, Elon's already trying to do that. He's, he's literally trying to build his own city for his staff, you know, which is outside of the system. Um, but the thing is, it's hard for the average Joe, like you and I, to to do something like that, because it, it takes tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds to do something like that. And like You can't do it within the UK, let's say. You, you have to go abroad, which means, okay, you need an island or something, or you need to buy a chunk of a country or, or something. So unfortunately, um, I think that will happen, but billionaires will be doing it. Then they'll have very high entry requirements to you know be part of their utopia. And again, the average Joe won't won't be able to get in. You'll need something like a hundred mil net worth just to be a citizen. I mean, I, let's take Guernsey, Jersey, and Guernsey. I think are pr prime examples of that. Of that. Um, so yeah, uh, Ignacio Redondo. Sorry if I've said that name wrong. He says, "Hey, Sim, I'm 20 and will graduate next year. Software engineering. Cool. Uh, any advice on what I should do next to become wealthy? Any life advice you'd give?" At 20 about money relationships thanks oh man i've got so much advice for you so software engineering right you're, you're about to graduate software engineering chat gpt4 is already a better software engineer than you'll ever be <laughs> like i'm not trying to wee on your on your parade here chat gpt4 and the sub subsequent subsequent versions of it um will will always be a better coder than you and a better software engineer. Um, or even if it isn't right now, 
just give it one, two, five years, a form of AI will be better at the thing that you've uh, better than you at the you know whatever it is. Um, hell, if you look at open AI, I think Codex. Let's stop. Um, yeah, Codex is the more coding related uh, thing for that. So if I were you, I would not, first of all, not say you're a software engineer. You need to pivot hard and go all in on AI engineering. Okay, you need to be a, a, an AI engineer. So you need to be someone that can create AI tools, you know, using, you know, GPT, you know, all that sort of stuff. For in instance, I have just set up a new business and the that new business requires AI. Now, I had two options as a founder uh, or as a, as a business owner. I could either hire like or outsource a software engineer or you know, coder to build this software that I need for this new startup uh, and pay, you know, handsome figure, etc., which would actually be cheaper for me in the long run to do that. Or... I, I go down the route that I've just gone. I've been searching for a CTO for this software company or this AI company. And what I've done is basically gone halves. So I found, I finally found a coder, someone that could build the, the thing that I need building. And instead of, you know, uh, and I, I would just say, hey, look, let's just go halves. So now this person who is in a, who was or is in a similar situation to yourself, he's older than you, he's now going to co-own this this business so if i'm correct and this business does well he's got equity he's got skin in the game he'll get a salary he'll get profit shares he'll and when if we can exit he'll have a nice exit thing so uh, you're 20 god damn you're so young mate um very jealous i'm 37 and I, you know sometimes i feel 50 odd um i would go heavy into ai i really would you've got to stay ahead of that curve I know it seems like a big old hype. Now, like with any hype, um, you have to be aware of the guts and the hype cycle. Now, being a software engineer, you're probably well aware of that, and it looks something like this. Um, or, and depending on the on on the tech, sometimes, well, it won't go backwards, will it? It'll, it'll look something. Oh, dear lord! It'll be something like like that. So at the moment, AI is, you know, somewhere around here, depending on what what type or anywhere from here to here. And there's lots of different versions of AI that everyone's getting all caught up on. So yeah, we're, we're definitely in the hype phase. Um, and we're going to have the, you know, um, we're going to have a plateau of some sort where, you know, like VR did, VR basically died to death or went quiet for 20 odd years. And I'm not saying AI will be the same, but yeah, go, very quickly, go heavy. Um, do Yeah, I would not buy a house. Do not buy a house. Uh, you need flexibility because if you're going to go down this route and you're going to try and become the CTO or uh, a coder within a startup or something for, you know, for equity, you need flexibility. Don't just put roots in the ground just yet. Um, and believe it or not, don't get a wife and kids uh, just yet. Just <laughs> them, like if you're 20 years old, let's say you, you, you've got a girlfriend and you now marry her. You know, 21, you're married. By 22, you're going to be popping out some sprogs, right? So now you're a 22 or even, let's say, 24-year-old with your first kid. By 25, you may have your second kid, right? You're you're very young. You'll then have two kids and a house and a wife. And then you, you'll have, like, less flexibility. You, you know, there'll be meetings that you won't be allowed to go to because your wife doesn't want you to be away for a week or for a few days or you know stuff like that you're just gonna limit your potential and, and I, it's a very controversial thing for me to say right you know but like I, and by the way i said this to my wife like i'm saying that if i was single right i would be far richer right now than if i wasn't if i didn't have a wife and two kids and you know kids at private school and all that sort of stuff like i would be far richer as a, a single you know single mingle type uh, person i could have you know there, there have been opportunities i've had in over the last 10 years which i've had to turn down for family now do i regret that no i don't i, I don't regret that but i'm just saying if you're 20 years old and uh, you i in my if in my boots or if i were in your boots i would be focusing on setting up your financial life first before hunkering down so yeah, sorry, controversial answer, but I would basically be money hungry, tune that 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 money sniffing radar, go
go heavy into AI and get equity. You need equity in something, okay? So uh, your next question, oh, sorry, uh, 20 years old, you're intelligent eating. So Adam said the last part of his question is most cr critical. At 20, you can take mega risks by not starting a family responsibility and working relentlessly for five years and fail until success. Yeah, I completely agree. In fact, yeah, it's just what I've just said. Yeah. Then he said, so I should become an expert in helping business integrate AI, even setting up my own. I was also thinking about developing in blockchain. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, either or they're both booming sectors. Um, but I mean, that's a, yeah, that's an easy win. If you can like nail chat GPT four plus all of the, you know, and use Zapier to create chat bots or, you know, whatever, then that would help. You can set up your own business then during that. Um, so yeah, there's, there's lots of things you can do. Hell, I, I, you know, my mum died um, a couple of weeks ago and I had a, an AI idea thinking, shit. Um, and I started thinking about my own mortality. If I suddenly just died, uh, thinking about my kids, and I thought, how about, you know, could I use ChatGPT4 to create Siam bot as in a bot of myself? Like now you can upload loads of PDFs and stuff to train your, your chat bot, so to speak. Could I upload all my WhatsApp history, all my email history, every article I've ever written? Um, can I create a little script that takes every tweet I've ever written, every interaction, every Facebook post, blah, blah, and just put everything, all my text message history, everything I've ever written into chat GPT three or four, sorry, and then train it to be Siam Kid. And then all of a sudden you've got basically, I've just botified myself up. So if I suddenly died, you know, and let's say connect it to WhatsApp, technically my wife and kids could still chat with me, even though I'm dead, they would be chatting uh, like a, like a fact, you know, a digital facsimile of me. And it's just a way for, you know, closure for advice, you know, when they're older, they're like, dad, what should I do in this position? And then Siam bot can give some wise and sage advice based on the shit that I've been through. I don't know. I'm not going to be doing that. <laughs> Free business idea. <laughs> um, I mean, hell, you could then take that 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 bot that botifying thing that you that I've just described there. You can then take that and do loads of different things. You could go to a billionaire, right, or a millionaire. Let's say someone famous, uh, uh, like a, a business guru, and go, "Hey, I've got this capability. I can create a digital version of yourself." And let's say, I mean, who does everyone like on the business scene these days? Um, I don't know. I don't really. Uh, Grant Cardone. I I personally dislike Grant Cardone. But let's say you went to Grant Cardone. You know, he's got a bit of an ego, and go, hey, Grant, I can bot bot you up, and you create Grant bot. Let's say Cardone bot, 10x bot. Um, and hey, here's this 10x bot. You can now pimp or license this bot out to all of your followers. So you can sell Grant Cardone bot for a thousand dollars a month, and then all of your followers and subscribers could have Grant Cardone bot. On their own whatsapp and so instead of hassling you for questions they just chat with grant cardone bot and get all their answers i mean that's a business in itself Fucking hell do that mate come back to me and then <laughs> once you set that up that's a huge business um salman shaikh says hopefully i've said that right uh, thanks for all the same device i really appreciate you are oh, thanks thank you uh ignacio so you recommend trying to become a cto instead of becoming a business owner you always say only biz owners become wealthy well if you got no uh let me put in um context to that you need equity so if you've never been in business before you need you, you won't there's loads of business type stuff that you uh, you're, you're 20 by the way um so yeah it doesn't hurt to be the cto of a small startup because you'll learn loads of stuff i mean hell but you can try and be, yeah in fact screw that try and be the founder yourself and then fail fast okay you, you'll learn loads but yeah just do that botify thing that i just come up with uh elisa like harry potter keeps consulting dumbledore for advice after his death i have no idea yes but yeah sounds like that <laughs> um i haven't watched harry i've watched one harry potter movie when back in the day um Right. 
it's 13.54. I've got to go. I've now got a two-hour uh, live session for cryptos and trading. So, yeah. Um, create your own bot. Botify yourself up. Cyan bot. I like that. <laughs> right. Got to go. Hope today has helped and chat with you soon, guys and girls and those in between. Right. Bye.